awesome. Okie doke. Let me see if I can get this. Come on. Okay, there we go. Yay. Okay. Um, my this project that I'm doing is part of a larger project. I'm I'm looking at um, that has to do with legalization of international human rights norms in domestic venues. Um, so this is, uh, sort of, again, sort of part of a bigger project. Um, it also, though, deals with memory of pain because of the fact that the Dominican Republic uh, has basically refused to acknowledge um, the jurisdiction of the international, I'm sorry, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights uh, doesn't recognize the problem uh, associated with its treatment of the Haitian population within its borders. Um, and so as a consequence, really denies the experience of the um, Haitians of Dominican uh, descent who live in the Dominican Republic. I'm sorry, Dominicans of Haitian descent who live in the Dominican Republic. Um, so yeah, sort of refuses to acknowledge what they've gone through. But um, let's see here. Okay, so my paper basically takes a constructivist position uh, with respect to the identity of the, um, the Haitians within the Dominican Republic. Um, their identity of otherness. And so there's going to be a number of factors that influence uh, how the, the Haitians are perceived. Um, I'm going to briefly go over this because it, it's a it's a much larger story. Um, but first and foremost, uh, da, 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 da. okay, so uh, Haiti and the Dominican Republic are both parts of the island of Hispaniola. Um, the border here, uh, right here, um, is it's rather porous, um, but it's also the site. Uh, we have a lot of Haitians coming into the Dominican Republic uh, for various reasons. Um, a lot of it's going to be economic. A lot of it's economic, but also in response to um, uh, natural disasters like the hur the uh, not hurricane, the earthquake in 2010. Um, also, conditions of political instability. So they come historically speaking have come into the Dominican Republic. The question that the Inter-American Court has been dealing with is whether many of these Haitians and those uh, that are born within the Dominican Republic, um, whether they're actually citizens of the Dominican Republic. Um, according to the government of the Dominican Republic, and we're gonna see this in a bit, um, the government says no. Okay, and so you have this whole process of forced repatriation of Haitians, whether or not they're there legally. Uh, back into Haiti. So that's what I'm really focused on. Okay, let me go backwards. I didn't mean to do that. Okay, so um, factors that have influenced the construction of their identity. Um, between 1822 and 1844, Haiti occupied the Dominican Republic part of the island. Um, so you don't have a really good foundation for uh, Haitian Dominican relations. Uh, the Dominican Republic gained independence in 1844. Um, the sugar industry plays a huge, huge part in the situation and the problem. And I don't know why it just did that. Um, so I'm going to go back. Um, but there's a dependence on Haitian labor. And there's a lot of studies that have been done um, about uh, the treatment of the Haitian migrants by their Dominican employers. Um, uh, a whole body of literature that it's pretty much like slave slavery like conditions um, under which the Haitians live. You also had a, an instance of massacre sort of going back to Chris Davies um, his uh, discussion yesterday uh, the massacre of the Haitians by the uh, Trujillo regime and I think I had this on timer that's why it's doing this um, plays a big role in uh, the Haitian identity. Uh, so you have this dependence on uh, Haitian labor, um, and despite the history of maltreatment of the Haitians by the government, they keep coming. Um, right now, there's an estimated 650,000 to 1 million uh, Haitians and those of Haitian descent in the uh, Dominican Republic. Uh, some of these guys have paperwork. A lot of them do not. Most of them do not. Um, so they come to... <laughs> Once again, they come to uh, the Dominican Republic poor and illiterate, and essentially they stay that way. Uh, many of them who uh, work for the sugarcane industry, they uh, live in batailles, uh, these uh, worker villages which don't have any sanitation, no clean water, um, no conditions of security. And I would say overall, and I'll go ahead and go forward here. 
um, I'm gonna get to the laws here. Um, the Haitian uh, population within the Dominican Republic and those of Haitian descent um, are really defined outside the universe of human obligation as Helen Fine would uh, categorize it. Um, they are uh, particularly vulnerable, especially women and children. Um, a lot of these folks get, uh, minors will get re forcibly repatriated without uh, a, an adult accompanying them. Uh, the ch children and women are subjected to uh, sexual violence, um, human trafficking. There's also that particular issue. Um, and so they're taken, many of these people are taken in the middle of the night. They're rounded up, taken in the middle of the night, forcibly sent back to Haiti. They're given no due process. Uh, they are subjected to conditions of violence. Um, many of them don't have time, aren't given time by the government to uh, to uh, get their paperwork, to show that, yes, I am a legal citizen. So they're just rounded up and sent back. Um, at the end of my presentation, I'm going to talk about sort of the rationale behind this or the theories that are used to explain this. Um, so we'll get to that in a second. Um, but if we're looking at John Paul yesterday talked about the continuum of continuum of violence, uh, Irwin Staub scale, um, I would say the Haitians in the Dominican Republic would be past the stages of three and four, three being scapegoating, uh, four being discrimination. I mean, they're, they're moving up the ladder there, um, unfortunately. Uh, so they're probably around uh, group five where, you know, the population is taking part in this destructive ideology um, against the Haitians. Um, Okay, so uh, yeah, an important aspect of this is the creation of a stateless group of people, which I'm going to get to right here. Um, people that used to have uh, citizenship, persons of Haitian descent that used to have citizenship, but the citizenship was stripped away from them uh, in a court ruling in 2013. And so that particular group of people are very, very vulnerable. Okay, deny the protection of the state. Uh, state resources, education, healthcare, all of that sort of thing. All right, um, so issue of citizenship. Okay, so in the 1929 Constitution, uh, Article 8, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, stated that all those uh, born in the Dominican Republic have the right to citizenship except uh, those who are born to foreigners. And here they were really talking about uh, children of diplomats and that sort of thing as well as those born to those in transit. And so it's going to be like, what do we mean by in transit? It's gonna impact a whole lot of people. Um, you have had a lot of constitutions in uh, the Dominican Republic subsequent to the 1929 constitution, but that article, that language about citizenship uh, has still remained the same. Although I think in later uh, constitutions, it's not article eight anymore, it's article 11, but it's the same thing. Um, with respect to how to deal with repatriation, it's been a long-standing problem, obviously. You do have a 1939 agreement between Haiti and the Dominican Republic um, that basically says that, um, what does it say? Uh, that each country can define who is and who is not an immigrant so you do have issues of sovereignty there. At the same time, uh, there's an agreement between the two countries that if repatriations are going to occur, um, they're going to be, uh, they're going to proceed according to due process. Um, similarly, you have a 1999 protocol of understanding between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And this comes after a whole bunch of repatriations, uh, forced expulsions, uh, Megan talked about this yesterday in her study. Uh, there's one in 1991, 1993, and I believe 1996. So you have this agreement in 1999 between the two countries where they say, okay, um, repatriations are going to take place, but bear with me, um, but you are going to have, they can't take place during the nighttime and you have to apply uh, due process, give the people who are being repatriated due process. Okay, so none of that took place. So despite these agreements, um, the mass repatriations continue. Um, and then you have beginning in the early 2000s, uh, there are some laws that are gonna be passed by the Dominican Congress uh, to basically tighten up who of these Haitians in the Dominican Republic does have access to citizenship and who does not have access to citizenship. Um, and so, Law number 20, uh, 285-04, 
redefines the status of Haitians to exclude those who entered the Dominican Republic illegally. So even if your your parents came, you were born um, in the Dominican Republic, if your parents came illegally, uh, the principle of use soli doesn't apply. You're there illegally, so you can be subjected to uh, forced expulsion. Uh, the courts, the Dominican Constitutional Court in 2010, um, oh, okay, I don't know why it did that. Again, I have the timing thing on here. But what it did was uh, created a stateless group of people. It um, it's, uh, reinforced this law, number 28504. You have a constitutional court ruling, uh, ruling of the Dominican Constitutional Court in 2013 that applied these changes retroactively to exclude people um, from citizenship who were born in the uh, rats, who were born in the Dominican Republic between uh, 1929 and uh, 2010. So that gets to the bottom here, the creation of the stateless group of people. This last law here, law number 16914, was passed by the Dominican Congress to sort of ameliorate the effects of this constitutional court ruling. What it did in, a fa in fact was provide some guidance uh, to these folks that were now stateless so that they could, um, well, this is sort of a good segue here, um, so that they could obtain citizenship. Okay, so enter the Inter-American Human Rights Regime. So um, yeah, the DR, the Dominican Republic and Haiti are both part of the OAS. They're both part of, which makes them subject to uh, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Uh, we'll take a look at that. They're also both part of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and it's really the court that I'm focusing on. Um, the OAS, uh, the actions of the OAS with regard to this matter really haven't been that much. Um, it monitors elections and does those types of things. The heavy lifting has been done by uh, the Inter-American Commission and the Court of Human Rights. So those are the two I'm going to focus on. Okay. Um, yeah, so the Inter-American Commission, uh, they perform on-site visits uh, when they're invited by the Dominican Republic. They issue reports and make recommendations on uh, the situation. Their focus has been on the absence of due process given to uh, those who are being uh, forcibly uh, you know, repatriated back to Haiti, um, as well as a poorly run structure. That whole um, classification scheme that I just talked about, let me get back here, in that previous, uh, what was it, 160, yeah, 169.14. I'm sorry, I'm flipping back and forth. All right, let me just go forward. Sorry. Okay, let's talk about the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. This is where the bulk of the stuff is going on. Uh, you have two really important cases. There are other cases dealing with the Haiti issue, um, but you have the case of uh, girls, Yin and Bosco, and the case of expelled Dominicans and Haitians. Those are the ones I'm going to focus on. Um, in the case of girls, Yin and Bosco, you have a situation where these, uh, these girls were trying to apply for citizenship. It was denied to them. Uh, the court ruled here, let's see, that the migration status of the parents, of these girls' parents, can have no impact on that of a child if the child was born in the Dominican Republic. So the principle of use soli uh, would apply. Um, and furthermore, the court stated in the girls' case that the status of being considered in transit was inapplicable because the mothers of both of these girls were born in the Dominican Republic themselves and could hardly be considered as passing through the country. Um, that's me paraphrasing. So you have a situation here where you, you have girls born, girls of Haitian descent born to two mothers of Haitian descent who were in the country illegally, essentially, um, or considered to be illegal. All right, so um, the case of expelled Dominicans and Haitians is a big one um, because the court in this particular case ruled that that constitutional court decision back in 2013, 168-13, uh, uh, was, was wrong, right? The constitutional court uh, had it wrong. Um, you can't apply, uh, it's very highly critical, you can't apply uh, the, um, the, the, the status, the law retroactively to deny net citizenship to all of those citizens. Um, it's in violation of a number of you know, general principles of international law, as well as violating uh, court jurisdiction, I'm sorry, the court jurisprudence in the girls case and um, 
uh, the country's own constitution. The government's response to this, to the, the very critical uh, court ruling, ruling of the Inter-American Court, was to basically uh, the constitutional court in the Dominican Republic declared uh, that they weren't subject to the uh, jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Um, saying that what was it the the instrument of ratification was never accepted by the Congress, so therefore um, we are not subjected to the the court's jurisdiction. Um, it, well, interesting thing about that is that you have you had some judges within the constitutional court within the Dominican Republic who dissented and said that you know this instrument of ratification wasn't a treaty. Okay, so. Um, there, uh, it, it wasn't subjected. To, you didn't need ratification by the Congress, so um, you know this is unconstitutional what you're doing. But the, the government of the Dominican Republic has essentially uh, not complied with any of the court's decisions. Okay, it refuses to recognize that there's a problem. It denies that there's a problem. Um, there are some uh, well, some theories that explain this lack of compliance on the part of the Dominican Republic. Uh, some scholars attribute it to the type of decision uh, that's made. Uh, whereas um, in cases, it's sort of different from uh, the European Court of Human Rights because the Inter-American Court of Human Rights essentially monitors compliance with the decision all the way through. Um, the European Court of Human Rights doesn't do that, but the types of decisions that the Inter-American Court issues are those which have a monetary aspect, so they're monetary damages, but they also require uh, the government of the, uh, the recipient government to do certain things. In the case of the Dominican Republic, uh, it was required in all of these decisions issued by the Inter-American Court to publish the decision to uh, investigate and prosecute uh, claims of maltreatment, and there's quite a bit of those, um, as well as to uh, for the Congress in the Dominican Republic to change its immigration regime, to basically alter the laws. Um, and for scholars who are looking at compliance, what they argue is that, you know, look, the more complex the decision, the less the compliance, right? So the more the country has to do and the more actors that are involved, uh, within that country that have to do stuff, um, the less likely the um, the country is going to comply. That's partially true, I think. Um, but in the case of the uh, Dominican Republic, even the monetary aspect of the court's rulings have not been complied with. And those are by far the easiest or considered by scholars to be the easiest. Um, I kind of lean more towards this second explanation. Um, it, you really have the courts really operating in a top-down manner with regard to the Dominican Republic. Um, you don't have much in the way of judicial dialogue. Um, so, so what do we mean by judicial dialogue? Um, there are scholars that say that you know the the court will get greater acceptance of and compliance with its rulings if it cites within its rulings the case law of the country in question. Okay, and, and in the Dominican Republic, you have had judges and there've also been courts who have uh, ruled in favor of the Haitians. So you do have case law out there, right, within the Dominican Republic that the Inter-American Court of Human Rights could cite to include in its decision. And in so doing sort of get, you know, compliance partners within the Dominican Republic, but it's not doing that. You know, when the with Inter-American Court is citing stuff, it's citing um, international, uh, the law of you know the ICTY or uh, the law of the um, European Court of Human Rights, things like that. It's not really looking at domestic law or the laws uh, passed by other states within the the OAS. I mean, it could also be citing, um, you know, Venezuelan case law or something like that. It's just not doing that. You know, it's kind of operating as like this outside force. There's a lot more to this. We can talk about this. There's the conventionality control doctrine and other things, but I have a feeling I'm going to be running out of time. Um, but one more thing I will say with respect to uh, the lack of judicial dialogue, um, uh, unlike the European Court of Human Rights, which um, it, it's really able to obtain more acceptance of its rulings because it relies on what's referred to as an emerging consensus between the member states. So kind of it looks at you know where the member states are 
uh, have their ruling on this particular human rights issue and that kind of thing. Um, and again, this sort of goes back to the case law situation. Um, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights doesn't really do that. So it's not really looking at the emerging consensus among the Latin American states. It's looking at international law. Uh, so there's problems there. Okay. Um, a lot of this is going to do with the culture of discrimination. I mean, it's just, it's flat out horrible. Um, and it really is, you have had scholars who talk about, and this, this fits in with Megan's, uh, you talked yesterday, the fourth category of expulsion, xenophobic. That applies here. Yeah, um, you have had scholars um, and experts in the Dominican Republic on this particular itch issue. Uh, Brigitte Wooding is one who say that the racism isn't as bad now as it used to be. I mean, yeah, that's true. No one's getting massacred like the Haitians did in uh, 1937 in the Trujillo regime. At the same time, this racism, discrimination is continuing to inform government policies towards the Haitians. Um, anyone who criticizes the government about this particular issue, whether we're talking about politicians, um, uh, journalists, uh, civil society workers uh, get harassed uh, because of this. Um, you've had, uh, the pr it's become a political question uh, the president, uh, the president-elect Abinader, hope I'm not mispronouncing that name, um, campaigned on this issue um, in October of 2010. Um, he was given a letter sent to him by, um, it was like retired military officers and uh, uh, politicians, basically calling on him to respect uh, the existing law and to, you know, tighten up restrictions and end the score, basically the scourge of Haitians in the country. Um, so yeah, that's continuing to, uh, to, to mess with all of this, uh, continuing to keep the Haitians uh, subjected to maltreatment. Um, one thing I would add, um, it's kind of like a weird dependency theory thing going on between the two countries. <laughs> a warped version of dependency theory where the Haitians come in, you know, they, they work a bit, they're paid horrible wages, they work in terrible conditions, they're rounded up, they come shipped back, but then they come back again. It's like they're dependent on that, on the Dominican Republic as the source of labor. And so it's sort of like this perpetual cycle of dependency between um, the two countries. Yeah. that um, and. In terms of like what role has you know the United States had on this or other folks, um, sort of was it Helen talked yesterday? Uh oh, there goes my thing. Okay, but that's okay. <laughs> that's fine. Um, Helen talked yesterday about if we don't cry wolf or if we don't do anything about this, this stuff is going to continue. Um, and, and that's the case here. I mean, the United States is a, a major investor in the Dominican Republic. Uh, Dominican Republic is part of the, the CAFTA agreement and all that sort of stuff. Um, there aren't any sanctions against the Dominican Republic for this maltreatment of the Haitian population. I wanna say because it's Haiti, nobody really cares. And I, I, it's unfortunate, but I think that that's kind of the truth. Um, so, you have a group of incredibly vulnerable people who are going to remain vulnerable for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's it. I wish I could end on a high note, but there's no high note here. Okay. <laughs>